28 is where we find ourselves this morning. Acts chapter 28. If you have your Bible, I hope you join me there. If you don't have your Bible, don't worry about it. You can follow along with us. The scripture is going to be up on the screen. But I do want to, I do want to just mention this one time. Um, we are a Bible teaching church. This is what Calvary Chapel is all about. We teach verse by verse, line by line, chapter by chapter through the books of the Bible. And, um, and I would encourage you, if this is your home, uh, to bring your Bible to church. You know, because listen, you can, you can look at the screen and you can see the verses up there and you can follow along. And that's fine. But man, if you're anything like me, it's like just holding that Bible and follow along as we're teaching verse by verse through it and seeing the scriptures come alive in your, in your own Bible. Oh, there's nothing like it. So I encourage you, bring your Bible to church. It's, it's very good. And it's also a great witness to guests and visitors that come in and everybody's got their Bibles and you know, there's nothing greater than the sound of pages turning, you know, especially in the Bible. You know, this, is, this is wonderful. So, well, Acts chapter 28, Father, this is your word, and we're here. So we've gathered in this place, and we're expecting you to speak to us. And we're expecting because, Lord, you, you, you are great, and you want to speak to us from your word. And that's what we hope, and we, that is the desire of our heart this morning, as, as, as we make our way through this passage, that you would speak to us, to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we love you, Lord. We love your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, here we are, guys. Can you believe it? We are arriving this morning at the last chapter in the book of Acts. And we're not going to finish Acts this morning, but we've arrived at the last chapter. And chapter 28 is a remarkable chapter. And it's really, just so you know, it's a continuation of chapter 27. The only thing we have is a break in the, in the story, a break in the narrative, uh, in, in what we would call the, the, uh, the chapter break. But just so I can set the stage just a bit for what we're going to be reading and studying today, it was there in chapter 27 where we learned of the beginning of Paul's voyage to Rome. Uh, be sure to note that Paul's not in Rome yet, but he's on his way to Rome. Uh, it was in chapter 27, we learn that Paul, as he's making his way to Rome, he's there upon a ship that's sailing across the Mediterranean Sea. The ship, we're told, is carrying 276 men. Some of them are crew members. Some of them are soldiers. This is Tyrion, and he has his soldiers. And then the rest of the men are prisoners that's being transported by ship to Rome. I'll remind you that Paul is a prisoner right now at this point in his life. Um, back in Jerusalem, the Jewish religious leaders gathered together and they plotted together and they falsely accused Paul of defiling the temple. They falsely accused Paul of trying to, uh, trying to uh, uh, gather people and take them away from the Jewish faith, Judaism. And, and they, they accused him of a whole bunch of stuff. All of the accusations they accused Paul of was false. And, 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 and he had a series of small trials. He had, a, at least that we know of, three trials there in Caesarea. And in all three trials, he received injustice. At all three trials, the men ruling over the trials would say, I find nothing wrong in this man that deserves chains or even death. But instead of setting them free, they decided to do the Jews a favor, and they kept him bound in chains as a prisoner of Rome. And so Paul, he's a Roman citizen. He's going to exercise his civil right, and that is, if you believe as a Roman citizen that you're receiving injustice in the, in the, in, in, in the part of the world that you're living in, well, you can appeal to go to Rome and have your trial heard by Caesar himself. And that's what Paul does. He says, hey, I'm receiving injustice. Send me to Rome because I want to stand before Caesar and I want to have my trial heard. And this is how Paul is put there on the ship. That's how he's counted there among the prisoners. And, and, and now they're making their way across the Mediterranean Sea. They're heading for Rome. And at this point, we learn from last week that something, something absolutely terrible happened. The ship, as it's making its way across the Mediterranean Sea, 
is caught in a vicious storm. A storm so grand that it was named the Eurocliden, which means a really bad nor'easter. It's a bad storm. The wind is blowing fiercely. The, the waves are tossing the ship around. And well, the storm is so bad that we're told the crew cannot even sail the ship. They just let the ship drive, which means they were at the mercy of the wind. They were at the mercy of the waves. And the, and, 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 and the storm just slowly took them away from land and drove them out into the open waters. Well, after a couple of days of this, chapter 27 tells us that everyone on board had come to the place of hopelessness. That is to say that they were preparing themselves for certain death. And in the midst of this terrible storm, in the midst of all the hopelessness, in the midst of despair, it was Paul the Apostle who was the only one on board who's found with hope, peace, and joy. How can this be? Why? Why is it that Paul can have such hope, peace, and joy in the midst of such hopelessness and despair? Because he had a promise from the living God. You see, we're also told in the previous chapters that God spoke to Paul in a very powerful way. And this is what he said. He said, Paul, be of good courage because not one person on this ship is going to die. No one on this ship is going to die in this storm. And so Paul clung to that promise. And Paul also clung to another promise, a promise that was given to him um, uh, several chapters back in the book of Acts. And that was that God promised Paul that he would make it to Rome. Not only would he make it to Rome, but he would make it to Rome and he would bear witness, he would give a testimony among ruling officials of, of, of his faith and of the gospel message. And, and, and Paul hung. He hung very tightly to these promises. And, and, and this is what gave him hope. This is what, what gave him joy and peace in the midst of such difficulty, in the midst of such a terrible situation. Now back at sea, it's night. It's pitch black outside. And the storm is still raging. And all of a sudden, the crew sent something. Remember, these, these are experienced sailors. They know what they're doing, and they hear they <coughs> certain sounds at night. And, 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 and the crew sensed something. They sensed that they were drawing near to land. Now, we're not, we're not exactly told how they knew this uh, from the Scriptures, but, you know, it's thought that they heard the sound of waves crashing upon the shore. They couldn't see anything, but they could hear it. And so this is what they did. They dropped four anchors off the back of the ship, just the slowest drift, and then they waited for daybreak so that they could see the land to see if there was a possible place on the land that they could drive the ship up on. And so, with that in mind, allow me to read to you verses 39 through 44 of chapter 27. We studied this passage last week, but I really want to just read it through because it, it sets the stage for what we're going to read and study today. Verse 39. And when it was day, remember they had prayed for day. The ship is anchored offshore. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors. They left them in the sea. Meanwhile, loosened the rudder ropes, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. Oh, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. And the soldiers, well, their plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But this, the centurion, this is the guy in charge, he wanting to save Paul, kept him from their purpose, and commanded those, uh, commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. My friends, their journey at sea has lasted two and a half months. They have fought the wind. They have fought the waves. And all the treachery that this Eurocliden storm could bring to them. And finally the ship runs aground. And it runs aground a couple of hundred yards off the coast of this, this island. And the men, well, they got to make their way to land somehow. We're told that the ship was breaking apart in the violence of the waves. 
And so they make their way to land, some swimming, some floating on debris and wreckage from the ship. But in the end, it was just as God promised. There was no loss of life among them. They all made it safely to the land. Now, where exactly are they? Well, verse 1 of chapter 28 tells us. Look at it with me. Now, when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. Notice verse 39 back up in chapter 27. Notice that no one on board recognized this land. The passengers on the ship, no, the crew, the prisoners, uh, the soldiers, nobody recognized this land. But shortly after reaching shore, they learned that the place they were at was an island called Malta. Now listen to this. It's a small island. A very small island. It's 17 miles long, 10 miles wide. And it, just, it sits 60 miles south of, of nearest land at all. And, and it's just a small island that sits right in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Remember, they had no way of navigating the ship. They were at the mercy of the wind. They were at the mercy of the waves. And yet somehow, some way, God guided and directed the ship through the storm right to the small island that sits in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. I'll tell you what's absolutely amazing about this. If you look on a map where the island of Malta is, you'll, you'll discover that if this ship would have been driven by the wind and the waves past this island, either by day or night, there's not land for another 200 miles. Which means certain death for everybody on board and total loss of the ship. Somehow God guided and directed this ship through the storm right to this small, tiny island that sits in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Absolutely amazing. So there they are, 276 men on the beach of Malta. What happens next? Verse 2, and the natives showed us unusual kindness. For the kindle of fire made us all welcome because of the rain that fell or, or that was falling and because of the cold. Now, just picture the scene in your mind. The natives of the island can see the shipwreck. They know what's going on. Not only do they see the shipwreck, they see 276 men struggling in the sea to make their way to land. Some swimming, some on wreckage from the ship. And, and the natives of the island of Malta saw the condition of the men when they reached land. They were extremely tired. They were hungry. And they were very cold. So these natives, they, they kindled a fire, made everyone welcome. Notice we're told specifically that the natives showed them unusual kindness. I love the word in there because unusual kindness is another way of saying they showed us great hospitality. Allow me just to park here for a moment. I want to point something out for your consideration. We find all through the Scriptures, I mean, it's littered all through the Scriptures, that God always takes note of kindness. Even when, when it's a pagan person or an unbeliever, God takes notice of kindness. God always takes notice of those who are kind to His people. I, you know, perhaps the classic example of kindness and hospitality is found in Luke chapter 10. Uh, you can turn there, you can just allow me to read it for you. But it's Jesus speaking. He's going to speak a parable. A parable about the Good Samaritan. It's Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. And remember, this is just a parable. But remember what a parable is. A parable is a story, a fiction story, right? But it's cast alongside of biblical truth. It's a story cast alongside of biblical truth. But look what Jesus says. Jesus teaching, he says this. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But then Jesus says this, A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, 
And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured, it, poured on oil and wine, and, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, and when I come again, I will pay you. So when, so, and then Jesus, this is where he gets to the application part and where he casts biblical truths alongside of the parable. He says, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he should show mercy on him. as compassion, kindness. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The point I want to make is this. In this parable, Jesus is speaking of a man who extends tremendous kindness and hospitality. Whether the man is a Christian, whether the man is saved, or whether the man has any spiritual insight whatsoever, we're not told. That information isn't given to us. As a matter of fact, we can make a reasonable assumption that the man wasn't saved. And he had no spiritual uh, knowledge of, of anything. We can, we can assume that he's an unbeliever, a pagan. And we can assume that because we're told that he's a Samaritan. Most Samaritans would be unbelievers and pagans and stuff. But the point of Jesus' parable is that of a man who extends goodness and kindness to someone else, and then Jesus says, you, you who hear this parable, go and do likewise. So the question I have is this. How did the man in this parable know to do good? I'll also cast another question alongside of that. How did the natives of the island of Malta have an urge, felt compelled to extend kindness? I mean, I want an answer to these questions. And the answer is this. Because within the heart of every person, even the pagan and the unbeliever, there is placed there by God a capacity to do what is good. I believe that with all my heart. In theological terms, if we're studying systematic theology, we would call this the eternal revelation of God. That's, that's the name we give to it. The eternal revelation of God. If you want to read about that, it's Romans chapter 2. You can read all about the eternal revelation of God. My friends, for the individual who has no knowledge of Jesus Christ, has never heard the gospel message, has never heard the word of God, even that person has within him the ability to do that which is good, to show kindness to others, especially in times of great need. But why? Because God has written it upon their heart. I wanted to point this out to you because it's one of the great proofs of the inward knowledge of God. It's one of the great proofs that God has revealed Himself to every human being. You know, how many times have you heard? I've heard it all the time. People commonly say, what about those who've never heard of Jesus? What about those who've never heard of the Bible, don't have the Scriptures? What about those who've never heard the Gospel message? What happens to those people? <laughs> well, my friends, the Bible's clear about the matter. God has revealed Himself to every human being. Every human being. God has written certain truths on their heart. And, 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 and listen, every, every human being has a sense of mor uh, mor morality. Every human being has a sense of what is right and what is wrong. Every human being has a sense to show kindness and to show goodness, great hospitality to those who are in need. And it's here in Acts chapter 28 where we see this display by the natives there on the island of Malta. We're told that the natives of the island showed them no little kindness. They showed them great hospitality, great goodness. I mean, they, listen, they, we're told they lit a fire for these men. They lit a fire so large that it warmed 276 men. That's a big fire, and that's a lot of kindness. Now... Now what they understood, <laughs> pick up with me in verse 3. We'll see what happens next. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, 
and laid them on the fire. Now stop right there. Don't read any further. If you go any further, you're out of God's will. <laughs> <laughs> but when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, keep in mind this large fire that's warming 276 men is not going to continue to burn unless it's fueled by something, right? And what do we find Paul doing? He's busy gathering sticks and laying them on the fire. Can I tell you what, what amazes me about this? It amazes me to see Paul willing to do the small, minute task of gathering sticks even when he's called to do greater tasks such as preaching the gospel and planting churches. Absolutely amazes me. When it comes time to keep the fire going, Paul doesn't point fingers. He doesn't say, hey guys, I need to stay right here and teach a Bible study. You guys go pick up sticks and put on the fire. That's not what Paul does. He simply sets the example. He gets up, he starts picking up sticks, and he puts them on the fire to fuel it. You know, this is a great leadership lesson here. You see, the normal mentality of a worldly leader is, is, is to not stoop to simple, minute tasks that have to be done. A worldly leader expects to command orders and then, and then to command them to other people and watch, sit back and watch others accomplish it. Oh, oh, but true spiritual leadership stoops to that level. True spiritual leadership sets the example by, by leading and doing exactly what they would expect other people to do. True spiritual leadership includes the mentality of a servant to have the eagerness to, to do the humble task as well as the greater task. One old preacher said it this way, if you're too important to pick up sticks, you're not as important as you think you are. <laughs> now look at verse 3 again. Something unexpected happens while Paul is picking up sticks for the fire. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks he, and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Paul's got to be thinking, really? Are you, I mean, are you serious? I've been in the midst of a great storm for two and a half months. I've been shipwrecked. And not only was I shipwrecked, I had to swim from the sea to the land. Man, this is when I think everything's done. A snake jumps out and bites me on the hand. Man, I mean, seriously, what's that all about? Now, I will say, just for your curiosity, that there is a great debate here among uh, theologians and Bible teachers as to whether or not the snake was poisonous. It's almost humorous to see these guys going back and forth. You know, was the snake poisonous? Was it not poisonous? Stuff like that. But I'll let you fall on either side of the fence you choose. But as for myself, I stand with the group that says the snake was poisonous. And then I'll show you why. Look at verse 4. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, what an image, right? I mean, here's Paul, like, are you serious? Snake bite me on the hand. But they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. The question I have is this. If that snake wasn't poisonous, then why did the natives expect Paul to fall down dead there in verse 4 after he was bit by the snake? The snake was poisonous. So all the people, all the people of Malta knew that Paul, um, or uh, let me say it this way, all the people knew of Paul there on the island of Malta is that he was a prisoner. They didn't know anything about Paul. They just knew that he was counted among the prisoners there on the ship. And they just assumed that he was a murderer. These people say concerning the snake bite, no doubt this man is a murderer whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. These natives really believe that although Paul has survived the sea, that man, justice has now caught up with him. He's been uh, bitten by a snake and now he's going to die because of it. And we're beginning to see a little insight into the spiritual beliefs of these, these people. They're, they're, they're pagans. We know that the people in the island of Malta were pagans. And, and, and you guys know pagans believed in many gods. 
They believed in Zeus, the father of the gods, Themis, the god, uh, the god of justice, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, Ares, the god of war, Apollo, the god of music. They believed in many, many more gods. So look at what happens next. It's, it's quite interesting. Verse 5 and 6. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, oh, well, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. <laughs> First he's a murderer who's receiving justice. Now he's not a murderer. Now he's a god. I mean, my friends, this is a great illustration of the constant... Um, um, Frequent changing of the human mind and the human heart. James chapter 1 uh, calls this double-minded and unstable in all your ways. This reminds me of when Jesus was uh, making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. The crowds were gathered around. They're chanting. They're cheering. They're filled with joy and hope. And they're saying... Things like this. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> They're excited. But less than a week later, after Jesus was arrested, after he was falsely trialed, these same crowds somehow have their minds and their hearts changed. And these same crowds were now chanting, Crucify him. Crucify him. We don't want this man to live. Crucify this man. So Christians, let, let, just let this be a lesson for us. We are not to be fickle people. We are not to be frequently changing our hearts and our minds, and especially on matters concerning the faith. Listen, as Christians, we are called to know what we believe and to know why we believe it. And the fact of the matter is this. If the Bible calls something a sin, it's a sin. And we should stand there confidently. If the Bible says something is right, then well, it's right. And we should stay there confidently. Uh, by the way, if you're still wondering about this snake bite and trying to get your mind wrapped around what's taking place, I'll, I'll just offer a suggestion. Um, I see it as an unexplained miracle of God. And that's just kind of where I stand. Paul knows that God has promised that he would stand in Rome and, and give a testimony to the ruling leaders there. Paul knew this. Paul, Paul's way of thinking was something like this. If, if God has promised me that I was going to go to Rome, and I haven't been to Rome yet, well, you know what? Then surely nothing's going to deter him from fulfilling his promise. You know, I can see Paul. He's holding his hand out. The snake has latched to him. It's a poisonous snake. And after he shakes it off in the fire... And all the natives have gathered around and are waiting for Paul to just fall out dead. I can see Paul just looking at his hand and saying, Lord, this is on you. I mean, seriously. If I die here, Lord, it's, it's on you. But you know what, Lord? You're not going to fulfill the promise you gave to me. Lord, you said I was going to go to Rome. So what's a poisonous snake bite? Right? That's where I stand. I don't have some grand explanation other than to say it's just an unexplained miracle of God. Now, coming back to our passage, these natives of Malta are very kind and good-hearted people, but they are fickle in their spiritual beliefs. Uh, pick up with verse 7. Let's see what happens next. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was uh, Publius, and, and, and who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lay sick with a fever and they sent a tree, but Paul went in uh, to him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him, and he healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. And so we're introduced to this guy, Publius, and he seems to be the leader, the guy in charge there on the island of Malta. And, 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 and we're specifically told that his father was very sick. So Paul, he takes the opportunity seriously. He, he goes in, he prays with his father. He, lands, he lays hands on his father. And in doing so, 
God decides to heal this man. And, and, and what's interesting is that when the rest of the people on the island heard of this, and some even saw this, they too came to Paul, and they were here. Now I have to ask a question here, just out of curiosity, you know, I want to know, um, why did this take place? Why did God choose to heal the father of this man and everyone else that came to Paul? Well, I'll give you two reasons why. First, because God was showing kindness to those who had been kind to His people. Like I said, all throughout Scripture, littered in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, God always takes note of kindness, especially to His own people. Notice this is in, uh, 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 this is in uh, um, no way to say that God approves of their spirit, of their pagan spiritual beliefs and, and their worship of false gods. No, not at all. Not at all. But oftentimes, whenever kindness and goodness is shown to God's people, God will show kindness in return. Yeah. Well, we'll also note that when God does this, it's always to draw people to Himself. It's always to, to draw people to himself to have a relationship with him. A relationship only found in Jesus Christ. We find examples of this in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and even all throughout church history. So the first reason why I believe God chose to heal this man and everyone else that came to Paul was because you know, of the kindness that they showed Paul. God was just returning that kindness back to them. Now the second reason would be this. God was establishing the credibility of Paul to be able to minister effectively to the people. Listen, there's 276 men who were on that ship. And they had to stay the winter there on the island of Malta. And, and there's not another ship that's going to sail north towards Rome for another three months. If you know anything about Paul the Apostle, you know that he's not going to just sit around and twiddle his thumbs. Not at all. Paul is going to engage with people concerning the faith. Paul is going to share with people about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Paul is going to preach and he's going to teach the Word of God alongside of the Gospel message. And he's going to do this over and over and over again. So as Paul used Paul to heal people over that three months period on, on the island of Malta, Paul's credibility was being established and Paul would use each opportunity as a platform to share the love of God and to share the great things that God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Now let me just share something interesting with you. Tradition tells us, not Scripture, tradition only. We have no way of knowing if this is true or false. But tradition tells us that within that three-month period on Malta, Paul led many people to the Lord and he even planted a church there. It's just tradition though. Well, Paul has been through some vigorous trials, has he not? The storm at sea, the shipwreck, and even a snake bite to only name a few. And, 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 and it's amazing to, to, to notice there in the passage that after such vigorous trials, after such hardship, God has found Paul faithful and is using him in great and amazing ways for the kingdom of heaven. As we begin to conclude our time together, I, I'd like to just share with you two points of encouragement from this passage. First, allow God to bless you and to provide for you. Now these two points I'm going to share with you, that being the first, they're going to sound very simplistic and childlike. They're going to sound like something we need to be teaching back there in children's ministry. But I think that, that, this, that, the, uh, that it applies and I think we need to hear it. Listen, allow God to bless you and to provide for you. Don't hinder God's blessings and provisions in your life. Uh, let God bring about those blessings. Let God bring about those provisions the way He chooses to do so. For Paul, God used pagan, unbelieving people to bless him and to meet several of his needs. And, 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 and you never know how God is going to do the same thing in your life. Amen. Listen, I've known Christians who have had certain needs 
and have completely missed out on a blessing or the provision from God because they hindered it one way or another. I'll give you an example. If you're in need of some money, say you fell upon some financial hardship, and you're in need of some money, and let's say that kind-hearted but pagan unbeliever co-worker finds out about it, and they come to you and they say, hey, listen, I, it's just... You know, it's just on my heart to give you a hundred dollars just so you can get by. Um, and then they even say, <clears throat> don't worry about paying me back. It's a gift. There are Christians who overanalyze this. They sit around and overanalyze. I had one guy tell me one time, one time this. Overanalyzation over always causes stagnation. It's very true. <clears throat> Don't sit there and overthink and overanalyze the matter. Do I take the money? Do I not take the money? No, what's God going to think if I take a hundred dollar bill from a pagan unbeliever? I mean, seriously, is God going to be mad at me? Is He not going to be mad at me? I really wonder what God is going to do. Is He going to bring justice and pour out His wrath on me? Like, God, what are you going to do if I take this money? Listen, stop thinking and take the money. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, consider it to be God's way of providing for you in a time of great need. It's just, it's just true. And remember, the reason that kind-hearted, unbelieving pagan is even offering you a $100 bill and even offering you any kindness at all, well, it's because it's written on his heart by God. It was placed there by God. So listen, allow God to bless you and to provide for you and let him do it in the way he chooses to do so. Well, lastly, last piece of encouragement I want to share with you. And again, it sounds childlike, but I think we need to hear it. Keep living your life faithfully for the Lord. Keep living your life faithfully unto the Lord. If there's one thing we can say about Paul, is that he lived a life of faith. No matter what storm, no matter what trial, no matter what hardship came his way, his faith never wavered. And you know what? God blessed him for it. He blessed him for it. Listen, I know a lot of you. I've spoke to you, and I know your situation. There is many people, whether you realize it or not, that are sitting in this room, and they are in the midst of tough times, hardships, They're in the midst of a variety of trials, and and and, and I just want to say, let God find you faithful in the midst of it. Don't waver. Don't allow that hardship to overcome your faith. Would you agree with me? Yes. Jesus is greater than, the, than whatever it is you may be going through. Yes. So let's leave this place ready and willing to continue living our life for the one who has redeemed our life. And that is Jesus Christ. <laughs> let's remember Proverbs 28.20 says, A faithful man will abound with many blessings. You understand that? A faithful person will abound with many blessings. Oftentimes, I've seen it in my life, and I've seen it in the life of other people. Oftentimes, blessings come after the hardships. Amen. And they come because, because you are faithful through it. And God says, that, that person was faithful, so faithful through the hardship, I'm going to bless them. Jesus. Stay faithful, my friends, and live for Jesus. Jesus never said that following Him would be easy, but He did say it would be worth it. Amen. Father, we love You. And we love Your Word. And Lord, we ask that You would take the simple truths that we've learned in this passage <coughs> and embed them into our minds and our hearts. Lord, we ask that You would bless this day as we leave this place. and We, we go out from here, Lord, encouraged, exhorted from your word, we go out, Lord, ready to continue to live our life in faith. And really, Lord, to allow you to bless us and provide for us. 
how you choose to do so. Work that in our life, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.